This time I've got the second of the Star Wars short story collections with Tales from Jabba's Palace. Tales from Jabba's Palace is the second of the short story collections we've covered thus far, and as with the first, we have a mixture of writers we've covered in the past, like Dave Wolverson, Timothy Zahn, Kathy Ayers, Kevin J. Anderson, and some newcomers. Not as many more of the more flashy newcomers this time in terms of higher profile authors who are dipping their toes into the Star Wars universe. A few people who've gotten occasionally Hugo Awards for best short story, but nothing like quite as high profile necessarily. Unlike Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina, which focused on the outer lives of the characters who happen to be present during the cantina scene in A New Hope, Tales from Jabba's Palace focuses on alternative perspectives of the events leading up to the rescue of Han Solo from Jabba's Palace in the Battle of the Sarlacc. Consequently, while we get the internal perspectives of each of the characters in the book, their focus are less on the larger narrative that happens to intersect with a minor event that would be of cosmic significance. Instead, I compare this work to being closer to Rashomon, giving multiple perspectives on the same event, how the biases of each of the characters and their own motivations color how they view those events. Consequently, we see all the personal schemes of each character in the book and how they've been interacting with the schemes of the other members of Jabba's entourage leave them completely oblivious to the plans of Luke, Leia, and Lando. They generally don't believe that Luke is a Jedi, they have no idea what Lando is up to, and they can't imagine a a plan like our heroes of having any chance of success, because if it did, then they would have thought of it themselves. Also, consequently, because a lot of these characters are also on Jabba's sail barge at the time of the Battle of the Sarlacc, a lot of them are killed in the battle, and many of those who aren't are killed in the aftermath of Jabba's palace as everyone makes a break for freedom, treasure, or revenge. Many of those who aren't killed there are effectively killed by the Bomar monks who also inhabit the palace, who decide to start just grabbing members of Jabba's court and yanking out their brains to put in jars. Speaking of which... We are introduced to the Bomar monks, who believe in isolating themselves from feeding, feeling an emotion, ultimately by removing their brains from their skulls and putting them in nutrient jars which they will occasionally use to travel around inside spider droids. Droids. Well, they claim they believe that. Well, the fact that they would then forcibly recruit a whole slew of members of Jabba's court, including Bib Fortuna, after Jabba's death, would imply that there is a certain degree of intellectual dishonesty at play, at least with the this particular monastery. We also see weak race society beliefs, and um, th this is really bad, like... I can't tell whether, what they're going for on this, whether it's meant to be a parody of bureaucracy or if this is some atheist writer trying to do an over-the-top mocking parody of religion so that they could pat themselves on the back over how clever they are compared to, the, to those morons. Like, they, their religious beliefs require that they, um, that any decisions made by the weak way must be done through 
a board of directors formed of any and all we cray at a location made in the meeting following something similar to Robert's rules of order. And if there are insufficient, insufficient people to have a quorum, they decide by consulting the Quay, which is an electronic device that is effectively a magic eight ball sold to the Quay by an off worlder who bought this whole, who bought into this whole idea, both metaphorically and financially because the implication is the Quay are all stupid and gullible. Yuck. Again, not a lot of characters from this book will be appearing in subsequent works, what with them being dead. There are po exceptions, one possible, two confirmed. Bib Fortuna is the possible. He is one of many people plotting to kill Jabba, and his plan utterly fails though min made up for by the fact that Jabba is in fact killed by, you know, Han, Leia, Luke, Lando, that group. But now before Bib Fortuna can take control of Jabba's empire, he's captured by the Bomar and recruited. Though even as a Bomar, he keeps planning to find a way to get a body back. We see how Boba Fett got out of the Sarlacc through a combination of luck, cunning, and being really good at riling people up. We see Mara Jade's infiltration of Jabba's palace and her attempt to get on Jabba's sail barge, and the fact that it fails basically due to her running into about half the murder plots in the palace and just not having time to ingratiate herself into the, net into the network of plotting to allow her to get her way. I did not like this book very much at all. It's a very bleak anthology, with each story basically being its own tale of sorrow, hopelessness, and despair. If Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina worked well because of the variety of tone of the varied stories, this one fails because of its uniformity. In short, the only real way to get a break from the hopelessness is to stop reading the collection and read something else for a bit. Ultimately, this made the book something of a slog to read. The one book that had a hopeful ending to it, um, or the one story that had a hopeful ending to it, was the conclusion, um, The Fat Dancer, or the, the, the story of The Fat Dancer, Yarna Dal Gargan. Uh, it's the last story in the book. And it, it, that's one that ends on a hopeful note, and to an extent, I want it does reaffirm some of the main themes of Star Wars, that, that hope and courage can overcome great obstacles, um, great efforts. Um, and by, and through working together, we can overcome great threats and great dangers where Yarna and the other character in that story, who she ends up wor working with to escape from Jabba's palace together are not, are not only able to make it from Jabba's palace to safety in Mos Eisley, but also are able to get a treasure valuable enough, without getting spoilers, to allow them to survive and for Nyarna to obtain her, to achieve her goal of, of getting her children back. Or at least hopefully attain her, uh, get her children back. It doesn't get too much more beyond that point. Other than that, like, the humor in the book is incredibly mean spirited. And, like, the last story is the one that's, like, the really most hopeful of the work. Like, there are a couple other stories that kind of do well. The story with um, Boba Fett and his fate in the Sar- and him how he gets out of the Sarlacc is interesting and engaging. And... The story about the um, or the head droid, the towards the torture droid, um, EV ninety nine. That story also works well and is enjoyable and is a satisfying conclusion. But that's three stories out of a very massive book. Like if I kind of stretch things, the Mara Jade story, it's okay. It's 
it's, even that one's not very good. And Timothy Zahn's an excellent writer, and it's a character who he's who he found, did a really great job of finding the voice for throughout the um, Ron trilogy. So, again, give this a miss. There's not, it's not an enjoyable book. I, I didn't like it. Next time for Legend of the Force, we will be doing a um, Boba Fett graphic novel collection. And that should get us through the end of, I believe it's turn on 96. Uh, either, yeah, 90, either 95 or 96. Get us cover, finish covering the end of this year of the Marvel Star Wars, the uh, Marvel of uh, Star Wars. like and subscribe and also consider backing my patreon patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future let's plays also please consider backing my coffee uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show and it's not a monthly obligation or anything